Correct. So let us begin. Sarah, can you begin recording us? Yep, we are all set. All set to go? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the November 4th, 2020 uh, meeting of the Northampton Community Preservation Committee. Thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, as always, we begin each of our meetings with a general public comment. So if anyone has anything to say of the public that does not have to do with the specific proposal, now is the time for you to bring that up. Nobody on that? Everyone's here to speak to their specific proposal, yes? Okay, thank you. Um, we also have one bit of, uh, or two minutes to approve before we get to the general meeting. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of March the 4th? So moved. Uh, second? Second. Thank you. Discussion on that? Okay, all in favor? Sarah, we need a roll call even on minutes. We do, every action. Uh, Brian? Uh, hold on, Julia, were you, did you have a comment on? No, I was raising my hand to approve. I forgot we have to roll call everything. Uh, okay. <laughs> it just seems so easy. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Brian, uh, yes. Linda? Yes. Chris? Aye. Dan? Abstain from the March 4th one because I wasn't in the tunnel. Uh, Julia? Yes. And Jack? Yes. All right. Okay, thank you. And we have a second uh, minutes to approve that of October the 7th. Is there a motion to approve those? Uh, so moved. Thank you, Linda. A second? Second, sorry. Yep. Thank you, Julia. Uh, discussion? Okay, Sarah, roll call. Brian? Uh, yes. Linda? Yes. Chris? Aye. Dan? Yes. Julia? Oh, she raised her hand. Right. And uh, Jack? Yes. All right, unanimous. Thank you. We're all feeling so affirmative tonight. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sarah, for doing the roll call. Uh, tonight's meeting is mainly focused on the public comment sec section for the five proposals that we have in front of us. And I'm counting. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the uh, public out there uh, who are possibly set to comment. Um, Sarah, can you make known in the minutes that there were uh, five different letters that were sent to you? Uh, yes, two... and, and those have been added to the project files as well. Great. Good. I hope everybody got there that in their emails two uh, in support of the Academy of Music, one in support of Smith Charities, one in support of the Pine Brook uh, acquisition, and one in support of the Affordable Housing Fund. So those five will be added to uh, to the record here. So again, um, this is where you, the public, are invited to share comments on projects uh, seeking CPA funding this round. Uh, just for you to know that uh, uh, this round, we do have enough money to actually cover all of our projects. Um, we have available to us for our fiscal year, $993,000. The seven projects that have come up to us, two of which have already been funded, come in at $383,000. So for those of you that are new to this process, often we're faced with, uh, we're always faced with challenges, but often we're faced with challenges where we don't have enough money to cover nearly the amount of the projects that have come in. And this time it's a little bit different. We do have that, those available funds. That's not to say we will spend them all and we can carry funds over, but just for you to know what that, uh, what that, uh, what that budget is like. So uh, let's begin. Um, it looks like we have at least a couple 
of uh, folks here for the uh, Pine Brook connector. Uh, it seems like that is the case. So do we want to begin with that? Uh, Fran, given your role as an emeritus um, chair and member, do you want to lead us off with that? I'd be happy to do that, Brian. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful to, to come before the Community Preservation Committee after all these years of working on the Community Preservation Committee and to see all these familiar faces doing the right thing. Uh, now I'm very much an emeritus and I live at the Lathrop community on uh, 24 Crabapple Lane. And if you look at your map of the uh, Wilbur property, you will see just at the bottom of the map, you will see the Lathrop community. And, and one of the little streets, the very first one comes up and makes a little a little loop at the end. And I live at the top of that little loop. So every morning I bring my coffee to the study and look out the sliding glass doors into the Wilbur property. It's wonderful, it's beautiful woods. And we've seen in those woods, uh, I, I wanna comment on the, on the fact that this project meets the Community Preservation Committee general criteria, that it contributes to the preservation of Northampton's unique character, boasts the vitality of the community and enhances the quality of life for its residents. Uh, and I'm gonna put a personal spin on that just for a minute. Um, I look out the back door into the Wilbur property. Uh, I have seen there black bear, um, a possum, wild turkeys, one bobcat. Um, we have a red-tailed hawk that takes up residence just behind our house uh, in that property. Um, and almost every day I'm out walking on the trails because our trails connect to Boggy Meadow Road. Uh, we walk out to the beaver pond we walk out to the, to the big gate and sometimes even all the way to Fitzgerald Lake. We meet other walkers on that lake. And in this, it's this difficult time of COVID, it's just about the only place we go. So this land, 53 acres of it, is critically important to us. It's critically important to the connecting this larger property that the city has so much interest in on our behalf. Um, and it serves our needs. It, it preserves wildlife habitat. Uh, it, gives, it, gives, it gives climate change a little boost in its own way. Uh, and I couldn't tell you how important it is to us. I, I want to support it wholeheartedly. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Fran. Thanks, Fran. Um, uh, other folks would like to speak to the uh, Pine Brook Connector acquisition. Uh, Virginia, uh, you have to take yourself off mute. Virginia. Thank you. Um, yeah, I live uh, basically uh, two houses from Fran, so uh, I have similar interests. Just Give, she's given those, uh, presented those interests very much. Um, I too am an avid hiker uh, out uh, along the uh, Broadwood Conservation Area. And uh, we have on our property, uh, we have a loop trail that connects us to the Boggy Meadow Road. So I feel like I live right beside the Wilbur property. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, and uh, as Fran mentions, in, in these limiting days of COVID, uh, the ability to have access to outdoor recreation areas, um, to hike in the fresh air uh, is a ma major asset. Uh, both uh, mentally and physically. And uh, 
<clears throat> so I, I favor your acquisition of the Wilbur property. Um, the one trail that uh, we have the loop trail and one of the loop trails has is the Wilbur property is alongside of it. So it's, uh, it's an important uh, piece of protecting that trail. And I think that probably does it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Anybody else like to speak to that land acquisition proposal? If, if I could briefly, I apologize again, my uh, video is not working here. Um, I'm Brad Tim, I'm a member of the BBC, a board member, um, and I, I second everything that you all have said about uh, the value of that property. And I look at things through more of a wildlife lens predominantly, and especially given the adjacency to that, that newly formed extensive wetland just to the north of the Wilbur property from the, the beavers, all the work they've done there, which is now you know pretty extensive heron rookery. Uh, there's a lot of amphibian reptile species that use that wetland. Um, and I imagine would use those uplands um, in the Wilbur property because uh, most, most amphibians spend most of their lives in the uplands. Um, I haven't actually been on the Wilbur property per se, but walked by it a number of times and, and seen all the photos from Laurie Sanders. Um, and again, with its uh, contiguous nature to existing conserved land, that's, that's a really critical piece uh, to fill in that, that puzzle. So we absolutely, from a BBC perspective, uh, are, are in big support of, of this purchase for sure. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, appreciate the time. Anybody else to speak on this parcel? Yes, uh, my name's uh, Dave Herships. Uh, like Brad, I'm on the board of the Broadbrook Coalition. And uh, I think uh, that uh, Fran and Virginia have stated very eloquently the reasons for uh, the committee to, uh, to approve the purchase of the, uh, uh, to approve the grant that has been requested. And uh, in particular, I think the write-up that the Office of Planning and Sustainability did was excellent. So I commend them for that. Uh, so the Broadbrook Coalition has been uh, working uh, very, very uh, avidly the last few years to, to pursue this because the property they had for sale signs up on it for quite some time. And we're very pleased to see that they finally have decided to go ahead uh, and sell the Wilbur parcel to the city. Uh, in addition to uh, all of the reasons that have been stated by Brad and Virginia and um, Fran, uh, there's one other very practical problem that the, uh, the acquisition of the parcel by the City uh, Conservation Commission would um, benefit from. Uh, several years ago, I believe it was 2016, the Beavers decided to build another dam and this, this dam was uh, on the Pine Brook and uh, there was a second dam on the Pine Brook, on the Wilbur parcel that caused the flooding of Boggy Meadow Road in the spring. I think it was in March, there happened to be um, whatever precipitation in March. And um, when, when the weather warmed up a little bit, there was a lot of uh, flooding on Boggy Meadow Road to the point where no one could, could get by for weeks. And um, that was due to the, the second beaver dam on, if you can follow that, on Pine Brook. And um, Broadbrook Coalition had worked with the Office of Planning and Sustainability to try and pursue the um, installation of a beaver deceiver, which finally got done. I think it was in July by the time it got done and um, that alleviated the flooding. The, the point was that without ready access to the, uh, to the Wilbur parcel by uh, Broadbrook Coalition and uh, the Conservation Commission uh, in, in future years, if there's the beavers decide to build a new beaver dam on there, it's, it's likely that uh, caused flooding of a boggy meadow road and it was impassable. The water was, was probably six or eight inches deep and maybe even deeper in spots and people could not get through there. So the Broadbrook Coalition would, would really request that the, the committee um, look favorably on this grant application by the city. And um, because the property has been on the market, uh, it's 
for, for several years now um, with the for sale signs, people have, the public sees the sign and say, why doesn't the city buy the land already? So we would like to see this, this, this purchase uh, kind of basically finally go through. Thank you, David. Uh, would anyone else like to speak on behalf of this acquisition property? No, good to go on this. Uh, David, uh, we're not hearing you, David. Yeah. There you go. Oh, not hearing you again. Uh, are, are other people hearing David? No. Did I miss a question? No, I think it's a different Dave. No, it's a different oh, okay. David. I'm sorry, yeah, David I'm Murphy. Sorry. Okay. Actually, um, let me unplug the headset. That probably would. Oh, there, there we go. There we go. There we go. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm very familiar with the property because during my time in the council, we had issues with drainage from the brook that runs down through there and the cotton property, and then goes underneath Hatfield Street, and and finds its way out to the river under the Big White Plaza. So I think it would be very, very helpful for the city to actually control that property and, uh, and be able to deal with whatever drainage issues come up from the brook that comes down through there. I see, you know, we have beaver complications now, but it's always been kind of an issue, the water that comes through there through the cotton property after it leaves there and then goes out under Big Y and, and finds its way down to the river. Um, you know, also the, the Wilbers, um, I was a high school classmate of Jody Wilbur and her husband is actually an environmental police officer for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I think it would be a great thing, and I'm sure there's family interest in seeing this wind up in the city's hands to have control of that strip from the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area down through and behind the Lathrop property to the Cotton property to be able to deal with the drainage issue um, that then goes under Hatfield Street and underneath the Big Y Plaza in a pipe and then out to the river. So. I think it's a very wise choice to use CPA dollars to try and wrap this up and give the city control of what could be a potentially uh, difficult drainage situation in addition to the quality of life issues for the people at the Lathrop community there and then the people on Hatfield Street. So I think it's a wonderful thing and, and hopefully you'll see your way clear to funding this. And I think for the Wilbers, it's a great deal too because I know Jody and her husband who's an environmental police officer are very, very engaged with open space and wildlife preservation. So hopefully this will work out and you'll be agreeable to funding it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anybody else on behalf of the Wilbur property? Okay, okay. let's move let's along to, uh, well, why don't we move to the Conservation Commission Conservation Fund, because perhaps people are, are interested in speaking to that as well. Uh, are, is, is anyone interested in speaking to that particular fund, which is adding to the Conservation Commission's Conservation Fund? No? Okay, so that's project number two. Project number three, uh, let's move to uh, the um, affordable housing fund. I think we have at least one person who's interested in speaking to that. Uh, Todd, would you like to address that issue? Sure. This is the affordable housing fund, but not the um, soft costs at Woodland. And uh, is that correct? Correct. This is the affordable housing fund. Okay, um, so I'm mainly here for the other project. Um, uh, on this particular, I'm, I'm Todd Weir, 124 Moser Street uh, in Northampton. I'm also chair of the housing partnership. Um, uh, in this case, I'm not necessarily speaking for the housing partnership. We don't have an official, uh, we have not taken an official vote on this particular project, um, but certainly I'd support it. Um, just for the need for um, soft costs and uh, site, you know, 
just to have those monies available um, is always a good thing and the needs for affordable housing. Um, but again, I'm not speaking uh, for the partnership on this particular issue. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Anybody else on the affordable housing fund? No one? Okay, moving right along to the Academy of Music Restoration Fund. Is there someone who would like to speak to that? Going once, going twice, no one. Okay, so last but certainly not least, the Smith Charities uh, Restoration for their building on Main Street. Would someone like to speak to that? David? Okay, uh, sound David again, dealing with your- My headset seems to be not happy, so I'll there unplug it. Um, today, the Massachusetts Historic Commission, the um, Tracy, our historic planner who's working with us, approved our bid documents and is gonna allow us to advertise at this point, so. As far as Mass Historic is concerned, we are moving along in a positive way and we're gonna be able to advertise and uh, get ready to select bids for the project. So um, from Mass Historic's perspective, we're on track, we're moving forward and uh, we're in a good place. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions any may, anyone may have about the project, but at least with Mass Historic, we're on track and in good shape. Okay, thank you, David. Anybody else interested in speaking on behalf of the Smith Charities Restoration Project? Uh, Linda? I uh, wanted to take David up on his offer to answer questions if that's all right with you at this sure. point. Um, David, I'd like to explore a little bit more um, the finances of Smith Charities, how you decide how much you're going to spend each year on grants and the reason it's it's not just nosiness on my part there's um i was re-looking at materials about the anti-aid amendment um and and what the courts look at in trying to figure out whether it's permissible to spend public funds for private organizations, and it certainly is um, within certain bounds. And one of the things they look at is whether the public funds are prim primarily being used for a public purpose or the extent to which they are really because they're freeing up funds that the organization would otherwise be using for you know the renovations or whatever, um, allowing their own business to proceed. And I'm not sure that was really clear. Mm -hmm. um, so I wasn't clear from your presentation um, quite how you decide how much is put towards your essential purpose, which is the the funding of the various grants, and how much. Um, reserve you're allowing yourself? Is it once all of the requests have been satisfied, then and only then do you put funds aside for the organizational's own expenses? Or how, how does that work? Yeah, well, that's why we find ourselves in the position that we're in, because for 172 years, we've given away most of our money. Um, we, we satisfy all the requests that we get. And, and hence, my predecessors, uh, you know, quite reasonably have given away the proceeds of all of the profits from the um, Oliver Smith Trust to the beneficiaries, which why we find ourselves in the position we're in, which means they haven't maintained the exterior of their building. You know, the interior and the structure is fine, but the exterior, uh, they've given all, away all the money for 172 years. So that's why we find ourselves in the position that we're in. Um, and we, you know, on the, on the student side, we admit uh, students when they're 
17, 18 years old, we pay them off when they're 21, 22. So we have years of people in the pipeline between 17 and 22 that we've allocated money for. Uh, we never know exactly how many widows we'll have. You know, life deals its unfortunate blow to people in an unpredictable way. So we never know how many of them we have. Um, we do nursing students, we do brides. We never know how many brides we'll have in any given year, but the money is available for them. So again, the reason we find ourselves coming to you for help is the fact that for 172 years, we've given away most of the money and haven't spent it on our building. And now we find ourselves kind of behind the eight ball um, with the condition of our building. And the condition has very much been justified by Mass Historic in their willingness to fund it, fund us. So that's why we're here is, you know, and I'm happy to provide additional information about how much, I mean, we've given away nine, over $9 million in the time we've been there. Um, but that's why we're coming to you because yes, we give away most of the money we have to our beneficiaries, which is why we find ourselves needing to come to you for help to fix our exterior of our building. And we come under historic preservation. And you know, I think we very much qualify that as a, you know, an 1865 vintage building that's a real timepiece. I mean, Mass Historic, their eyes popped out when they came there and said, oh my goodness, this thing is, you know, with the exception of our lobby, unspoiled by tasteless renovations. It's it's amazing, an amazing timepiece. And I'm actually disappointed nobody found their way to come over. Did any, hopefully people looked at the video we made of the exterior um, that really shows what we're looking at. And the exterior is where the problem is because the interior is, uh, you know, the structure in the interior is doing pretty well. It's just the exterior we need to yeah. deal with. I think a couple of us uh, previously toured it when there was a, an earlier- request. Oh, when we when yes. we did the study, yeah. yeah, thank you. So is there anything in the trust documents themselves that sets out um, how much is to go to the beneficiaries and only the, the balance into reserves or is that sort of self-imposed mm -hmm. or what's-, what's um, Well, we're supervised because this, yeah, we operate under the will of Oliver Smith, which is supervised by the probate court. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's a question, we go to probate court for a determination. For instance, when we, you know, we switched from indigent boys and girls to trades kids, because indigent boys and girls went away a while ago as a, a functional term, probate court gave us permission for that. So the probate court controls what we do. Uh, we typically are only allowed to put about 20% of what we generate in a year to the bottom line. So we have to kind of save for that. Um, we have more flexibility in years when we don't have a lot of applications, which unfortunately is now for at least the trades kids because we rely on Franklin Tech because we do, we go up and down the valley. We're not just Northampton, we do other communities. Um, we rely on Smith Folk, who I think sent a letter in support of us, but we rely on Franklin Tech and uh, Smith Volk to find our trades kids for us. That's the best place to find them. And because the kids haven't been in school, it's been a little hard. So we may have re more resources right now, but when the kids are in school at Franklin Tech and Smith Volk, we have a much better stream of them. And, um, and, and, and the nursing students always seem to show up. And unfortunately the widows always show up and then the bride's gift is pretty consistent. Um, so, with the exception of the trades kids, we have a pretty decent flow of beneficiaries to give money to, but the, the court set 20% as the maximum we can put to the bottom line, as long as we have a place to distribute the money to other beneficiaries. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, David. So is there any other uh, of the public out there who was interested in speaking to any of these five projects that we have? Uh, Todd? Yeah, I think I may have misunderstood. I thought the when you said the the um, housing fund, I thought the, the there was a separate project just for the two properties from the state on Woodland and Burt's Pit. No, there is not. So it's all one thing. It's then I misunderstood, and I should probably say something about those two, if I may. Um, certainly. So, so okay. just to clarify, uh, Todd, the, the application is generally for affordable housing pre-development purposes, but those two properties were specifically called out as Got areas where, where this is needed. So it would, those, those would be funded first. 
Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate that. Well, I, I do want to just say um, some quick words, especially on those two properties and the great value of developing them. Um, and I live close by them and often ride my bike uh, by them and things like that. And um, some of you probably know that we've been waiting a long time for those properties and uh, it's taken a lot of hard work uh, on the city's part um, to get them turned over from the state um, to the city and they're kind of the last two parcels of um, the whole property up here in the Village Hill area um, to develop. And, and I think it'd be a great benefit in terms of uh, creating some home ownership opportunities that we certainly need a great deal here in the city. Um, and uh, I think putting them back on the tax rolls, um, putting a few contractors to work in the project will be a great thing. And while, while they're small parcels and small projects compared to some of the other things that have been in our pipeline, um, every piece that we can get for more affordable housing and affordable home ownership, I think it's a great thing. Um, so I especially wanna to speak to approve those two projects. And the housing partnership did approve um, asking for the money for the soft costs on those, on those projects. And I think you have our letter um, in support of that. And I, I think it shows the value of, of having a fund um, and being able to move on things. Um, you know, it, it, when we're able to get money for soft costs, which isn't always easy, it leverages other funds um, and uh, makes it to have the capacity to um, get funds from say community development block grants or other places to build projects. So um, I speak wholeheartedly in support of that. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. <clears throat> Would anyone else like to speak on behalf of any of the other five projects before us tonight? No? Okay, well, thank you, general public, for speaking. Those of you that are still here, you're welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting, or you're welcome to check out uh, and uh, know that our next meeting uh, will be the 18th. We meet the first and the third Wednesdays of every month at seven o'clock. And as always, they are open for the general public on Zoom. So thank you. All right, moving down on the agenda, uh, Sarah sent us a mini uh, fiscal year 21 financial overview, which hopefully folks, uh, folks got. So if anyone would like to uh, or Sarah, do you want to give us a quick little overview on that? Well, sure. So this is, if I can figure out how to get on a full screen. Uh, so this is basically a synopsis of uh, what's available for the entire fiscal year. I, I've shared the um, annual transfers with you previously, and this is just a slightly different way to look at that. Um, so. Currently remaining, there's about 993,000 available. You'll see the state match surplus as a zero. Uh, that's because we will get a surplus, but we don't know what it is at that point. At this point, since we don't know what it is, I, I didn't want to estimate. Um, the approved projects um, includes the just one. It's the Omasta Agricultural Preservation Restriction Project that was recommended during FY20, but there wasn't quite enough funds on hand at that point. So it went forward in FY21. And that project also accounts for the smaller amount that is in the open space reserve as opposed to the other um, designated reserves. And then down at the bottom of the sheet, there's an overview of everything that's been submitted this round. Uh, the 65,000 for the water-based rec assessment and the 3,000 for the Pine Grove trails are, are not included in the amounts up above because they haven't gone to the city council yet, uh, but those were recommended by the committee, so I, I put those in approved grants. And happy to answer questions if anybody has any at this point. Uh, just the other thing I'd like to add to what Sarah said uh, is you'll notice a debt service uh, under the projected budget, that $530,125 is still going out to fund um, some of our largest acquisitions or renovations, Pulaski one and two, um, uh, still the Northampton Fields project. 
and know that this is the last year that we're going to see that line item this high. And Sarah mentioned to me that next year, fiscal year 22, our debt service should go down almost 300,000 to be coming in at 240,000. So this is the last big year that we have such a high debt service for those really big ticket items that we funded. And next year, fiscal year 20, uh, 22, we'll have a little bit more available to us because our debt service won't be quite so high. Uh, questions for Sarah with the financial report? So again, we have a total available to us for both the fall and the winter spring of $993,000. Uh, total projects for this round come in at $383,000. That, that does, uh, uh, and just know that we've already spent $68,000 uh, of that for the, um, for the Pine Grove Trails and the water-based recreation assessment. I guess just one other thing to note on the financial report, the Pine Brook Connector Acquisition uh, CPA request is, list, is listed at 75600 and that's if the land grant is successful. Um, I didn't have a good way to split that cell, um, but if the land grant is not successful, then there's a larger amount that, that's being requested from CPA. And I know Wayne was hoping to hear back by now, but unfortunately that hasn't happened yet. So that will be, that's an any day we'll hear. Hopefully. Uh -huh. Okay. I was hoping that lower number meant that he had already heard. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. It's usually before election day. I'm, I'm somewhat surprised it hasn't happened by now. Chris. Hi everybody. Um, so since we have a couple of moments and a, and a couple of bucks, um, I wanted to just float something and I, this is probably not, the time to have a discussion about it, but um, uh, this, this is going to be the first cycle that I've been involved in where we don't, even if we fund everybody, we're still going to walk out of here with money. Um, and it strikes me that um, th that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think we should fund things just because we have the money to do it. I think I think critical assessment is always important, but it strikes me that. Um, there have been programs in the past where because of fiscal constraints, we weren't able to fund them at the level that was either requested or even where we were, where we were, would have been happy. Um, and I'm wondering how um, we get them, um, if we have extra money, if we get them uh, more resources and, and sort of along the same lines, um, it strikes me that we um, we tend to we tend to hear um, requests from a core group of organizations who come back time and again. And th again, I don't have a problem with that. Um, and and occasionally we get a new request from a new entity. But um, I guess where I'm going with this is um, I I would like. Um, some thoughtful minds, if, 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 if you're inclined to do so, to think about how we might as a community, as a, as a, as a committee, um, begin to look for other ways to spend resources, by which I mean untraditional applicants, um, or um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but it, it seems to me that um, uh, as happy as I am to fund the groups that we fund, um, I, I, I get, I have this. I have this feeling in the pit of my stomach that we're not reaching um, some people who we could assist um, if they came to us and asked. And I'm not sure how to. I'm not sure how to go about making that happen. Um, I don't think we budget for any sort of outreach uh, that I'm aware of, and I'm not sure how we would do it, or put together a plan, or anything like that. But I, um, uh, I know from the last election cycle where I I was able to speak in front of a couple of groups. There are an awful lot of people who not only don't know what we do, but don't even know that we exist. Um, and my feeling is, is that if we're going to, you know, do the best work for this community that we possibly can, uh, that that shouldn't be the case. Um, and that rather than, you know, 
getting applications from the usual suspects over and over again, seeing, seeing a broader um, um, component of, 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 of the community actually coming to us and asking us for money. So just a thought. I'd, I'd love to add to that, uh, Dan Krasner here, if that's okay. Please. You know, I, I noticed that East Hampton set up a, a pandemic rent relief fund. And I wonder if if uh, if Sarah you know could, could direct you know, to the, you know, the appropriate city staff. Uh, you know, if that's something there's interest in the city or from the council or uh, Todd, who I was glad to hear tonight I see the sisters with on the housing partnership. And you know, maybe the housing partnership or the city council could be invited to the propose uh, if, if, if that's a, a model we'd like to replicate uh, that East Hampton pursued uh, for North for North Hampton. Sarah, sure, uh, I can speak to that a little bit. So, with COVID and all of the challenges challenges that that has presented, we have reached out specifically not only as part of CPA but also CDBG and through some other city and non-city initiatives um, to talk to those organizations and see who would be a good fit for a um, emergency rental assistance program and how that would work. Um, all of the agencies that, that we've been in touch with are aware of CPA as a funding resource, but they're just not ready to apply at this point. Um, because Northampton is a CDBG entitlement community, we do have some funding opportunities that other towns don't have. Um, so organizations have been taking advantage of that. Um, and they are thinking about how to fit CPA into a larger program, but it just didn't make sense, at least for this initial round with the eviction moratorium and some other funding opportunities that were available. But I do expect to see some type of application, if not next round, then at some point in the future. Oh, terrific, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chris, as always, you bring up really uh, interesting questions and thoughtful, thoughtful questions. Uh, I think one thing we initiated was our small grants application to try to get that out there and overcome some of the sort of bureaucratic hurdles of making it a little quick and easy and not so many hoops. But I think that's appealed also to the same old players uh, and hasn't really, really gotten out there. Um, Sarah, do you have ideas or uh, thoughts regarding Chris's outreach suggestions or? Yeah, and it, and it certainly would be great to see different types of applications from different applicants. I, I don't at the moment have any really good ideas of how to get the word out there. Um, in the past, we've relied on more sort of traditional media, but that's not really working with uh, a lot of national issues to cover and, and decreased press uh, for local things. Most of our um, uh, releases that we put out don't end, end up getting covered. They're pretty selective about what they do seem to put out and uh, we haven't had good luck lately. But I, yeah, I, if anyone has any uh, any ideas of how to get the word out there, ways to do outreach, I'd certainly be happy to do that. Sarah, other groups sometimes approach you and ask for information, groups that we haven't seen. I know because of friend of mine said they had approached you for information about it. Is it possible to reach back through your records to, uh, to uh, groups that have solicited information and let them know? You know, I sure I, I, like, I, I think that I had a friend who was affiliated with Anchor House or something, and they had been at some point in touch about the possibility of, of funds. And Sure, definitely. I mean, it's CPA is a challenge because it is so restrictive. Yeah. And a lot of the times new organizations that reach out about potential projects don't have anything that's eligible for CPA. Um, so that's most of the first contacts that I have. Like, hey, we have this great idea. Is this something that you could fund? And everybody agrees it's fantastic, but it's you know, it's not something that could be funded through CPA. One, one idea that Chris brought up that I found really intriguing is in the past, we've wanted to f fully fund projects or fund them more than we have. And we haven't done so because of financial limitations. And some of those have happened very recently. And is there a way to go back to those organizations and encourage them to reapply? Is that, is that ethical? Is that something that's appropriate for you to do, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I don't, 
the North Commons project, which is fully funded now and is underway, was one of them. Um, you know, the Academy typically doesn't receive all of the funds that they request. Um, it, it, it is more of the same types of applicants that we've seen come back once they don't get the um, all of the funding that they're requesting, but I, I could definitely go back and see who's only been par partially funded. Mm -hmm. Other comments about Chris's outreach? Get out the word. Well, I, I, I agree that we could get, we could be a little more visible in the community, um, but we also may see that the next cycle could be full of requests and we'd be back to our same old position of funding. I don't know if it's a time, timing issue this time around, but I do agree with Chris that we could uh, be a little bit more visible in the community if we had a, an outreach program that would reach more people. Linda, any comments? You're muted, Linda, unmute. There I was trying to be respectful. Um, I, I was having the same thoughts of, of uh, that that Jack uh, expressed that <laughs> this may be just a moment in time. Um, so the 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 notion of getting the word out there, I, I, I certainly support, but I think we may end up str struggling <laughs> and meeting out uh, partial awards and having to say no to people again. Um, I did wonder, Sarah, if you know of stuff that's in the pipeline that we might be expecting in the second half, the second round of this year, just, just to give some context to all of this. Other than the emergency rental assistance, which isn't really defined at this point, um, I'm not aware of anything. I know there's, there are no large affordable housing projects underway at the moment that have a funding gap. Um, the open space applications that Wayne has put forward are the city's big priority for the year. Um, nothing else in the pipeline that I'm aware of, at least. And that makes Chris's comment very, very timely because <laughs> we may want to drum up business for the next cycle then. Unless you want to develop a swimming area in, in the city someplace. <laughs> Um, we might. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Linda, I didn't need to step on you. No, I, I, I thought of something and then I rethought. So I'm not, I'm okay. not I've pulled that thought back. Yeah, well, then, then I'm going to take another run. Um, my, 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 I, I don't even want to say my concerns, but my, my thoughts on this, um, uh, that, that's sort of been amplified by the fact that we have a surplus, but that, but that, they're unchanged. Even if we were in a competitive environment, um, I would still be happier if I saw a broader, broader spectrum of the community coming coming to us with requests. Um, I hate to say no, but I think I'd rather say no to people I don't don't already know. Um, and the other part of it is, um, and I and I I apologize for not having done the legwork in advance, and I apologize for probably not doing the legwork after this. But it seems to me that we spend a goodly amount of the money that um, we're, we have uh, to allocate um, for, for projects um, being um, submitted to us by the city. And I'm not saying that that's inherently evil, um, but it seems to me that um, uh, I, I want to do I want to do more. I want to do more than that. And I'm not saying that the city isn't doing great things on behalf of of all of us, um, but I want to see other types of ideas being floated rather than the continued acquisition of open spaces or or, or uh, paying of soft costs for for for, for city projects. Um, I, I just feel that my mandate is is broader than that. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it the way that CPA is structured is a bit limiting because of the anti m aid amendment that Linda brought up and enrollment and all sorts of other issues. And there are lots of really worthwhile and really exciting projects going on all around the city, but a lot of them wouldn't pass the public benefit test. So it, while they're out there, 
uh, unless it's a group specific focus, it, it does make it somewhat challenging. And I, and I don't know how other communities have dealt with this or whether they found a way to um, encourage additional groups to work with um, different types of projects and maybe it's time to get Steve Sanger to give us another visit. Huh. Um, welcome, Martha. We knew you were Thank you. Uh, at another meeting. Our public comment uh, section is over. Um, I think we had five, six, seven people speak uh, during that. And now we're talking, we're sort of addressing an issue that Chris brought up, which is given that we seem to have uh, more funding than we often do, or uh, particularly the last few years, how to broaden our appeal and how to how to get the word out. So we're sort of just brainstorming uh, some of the, some of those issues. Um, one comment I'd like to make is I'm on the board of the Survival Center, and we're always encouraged as board members to be ambassadors for the Survival Center and always talk it up. It's a great organization. You should give money. Blah blah blah. And I think it perhaps behooves us as members of the uh, Community Preservation Act to be ambassadors as well. And if we're in settings, one, we could tell how, what a wonderful benefit it is to the city. But if you know anyone in these target areas and you know, maybe you would wanna consider it. Um, maybe it doesn't fit into the, into the uh, specific criteria, but maybe it does. And, and we don't know that unless we get the word out and ask. So we can sort of do that as personal ambassadors as well. Uh, Julia, any comments on this? Um, it's always so funny to come out of Parks and Rec. It's not that Parks and Rec isn't a priority because it obviously provides a, a, a you know, a public good. Uh, but I do recall that fairly recently we rejected outright a Parks and Rec application. And so it wouldn't surprise me if some piece of that comes back. I think it was netting at Florence Fields or baseball field things and so I, 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 we, we haven't had a, a commission meeting, but I will, you know, I'll bring it back to the commission about the possibility of putting something in. Great. Thanks. And I'm sure there's a fund for cats. I just, I don't know. Mm, particularly okay. ones that are shedding. Wow. That cat. <laughs> um, Martha, any comments that you have? I know you're joining us late in the game, but thoughts on outreach? Uh, unmute, Martha. I usually have the opposite problem that it's muted. It's not muted. Um, well, you know, I think the Historical Commission, um, there's a lot of work that the commission um, could be doing and um, should be doing, and we haven't had the funding for it. So I think it's, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to bring this up with the commission and brainstorm with them about potential projects we could be undertaking for the city. Um, so I'm happy to do that. Dan here with just, just a, a question, if that's okay. Is, is there any any precedent for us uh, in, the, in the past or other uh, community preservation committees across the Commonwealth of provided just, just general taxpayer relief or refund of, of uh, CPA funds? Is there a legal way for us to do that or, or uh, make a, a proposal to the city council to just provide general relief of some kind? So once uh, CPA funds are collected, they remain in the, um, in the reserves where they're put um, and the, the only way to do that would be to reduce the overall CPA tax surcharge. So, so no, no history or legal way to issue a, a, a refund of unused funds back if, if we wanted to propose that, no, that policy no, to the no. council. Ryan, you're muted if you're talking. Thank you, Linda. Um, do other CPC, Sarah, that you know of, have they ever used some of this sort of flush times to reduce their debt service? 
or is that not something? Uh, I don't know. I, I certainly could look into that. Perhaps you could do that if that's not too much to add. Sure. Yeah, I can look into that. Right. Any other comments on Chris's idea? Well, I will raise now what I was thinking of before, which, which was I think we were asked at one point um, to try to fund the, the uh, affordable housing reserve in, uh, over the, the 10%. And we were not in a position at that point um, to do that. We don't know whether we will be until we see um, next, next, uh, next uh, round of uh, application, but there might be a possibility of setting some funds aside because when those projects do come in, they tend to have very large numbers associated with them, very large asks, and it kind of kicks the stuffing out of all the other applications in that particular round. So if we have the opportunity, it might be something we want to consider if there's a, you know, a one-off uh, time of unspent funds to, to beef up the affordable housing reserve. Thank you, Linda. Can Any I other comments? Yes, please, Chris. Um, so I, I want to apologize, but it was not my intention to take up uh, really any time on this. I just really wanted to get people to think about it because it's something that crossed my mind. But um, with Linda's suggestion in mind, do we have, and I'm, I'm not familiar, really familiar with how this fund works with regard to the CPA's, you know, uh, resources, but um, do we have it, it within our mandate to um, sort of, because that sounds almost like we're initiating a grant. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but do we have it within our mandate to initiate grants? Or what's the mechanism for us to put money into something where there hasn't been a specific request? The way that the, the CPA is implemented by individual communities is really left up in the air. So it's it varies widely across the state. Uh, as long as the, the minimum requirements are met, then the state leaves the rest of it um, up to individual municipalities. But we so that's something that, that could be a possibility, although Northampton has not done it in the past. But we do have a fund, we do have a housing fund request on uh, in front of us right now, right? For like for $50,000. And yes. it seems odd enough to say that we could fund it for more than fifty thousand dollars. They've asked for fifty. Maybe we could put more into the fund. And that would right. be true of other proposals as well. Yeah, right. that, uh, all uh, it takes is a motion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't make that motion because I'm not a fan no, of no. that fifty thousand. Um, I hear you. But but, um, but I hear what you're saying. Any other comments on? Chris's thoughts. Martha? I'm, I know I'm not a committee member, but I'd like to sort of make a little point of order if I could, if you would in entertain that. Uh, certainly. Um, from my years of chairing municipal finance, Northampton has the maximum 3% surtax at the moment for CPA. I would encourage you not to reduce your debt because the community could vote to reduce that 3%, you know, way, way down, but they cannot reduce it lower than an amount you need to service whatever debt you have out there. So if you're committed to all of the projects that you funded and you use your surplus to pay down that debt, at some point the community could vote to drop that 3% to 2% or 1%, they can't go lower than what it takes to fund the debt you've already agreed to service. So paying down your debt could not work out for the concept of the community activities you're trying to fund in the long run. So I'm, you know, even if Sarah researches and says, yes, you can do that, if you're all really committed to the things you're funding, it's probably not a good idea because the community can reduce that 3%, but not below what it takes to fund the debt you've already taken on for the projects you support. So you want to keep that in mind. Thank you, David. Martha? Correct. And, and even if the CPA were to be repealed in Northampton, the same would be true. Martha? 
Is there a concern, uh, concern that there will not be additional projects coming in in the spring for a second round? Sarah? Uh, we've never had a round where nothing comes in. Um, and the second round in 2019 was light, but that's because applicants knew that there really wasn't any funding available. Um, I, as I said, I do suspect some emergency rental assistance applications um, and probably some other things that people have in the pipeline that I'm just not aware of at this point. I mean, I'm just wondering if, and maybe you talked about this, this is part of this is just a reflection of what's going, the, you know, the effect of COVID that people are, you know, scrambling to kind of keep things together and um, not able to think, you know, ahead as they normally would be. I, I don't know. Mm. It might be just an anomaly. Yeah, it's interesting. I just know that a lot of work has been delayed and slowed and, um, you know, deadlines have been pushed and so forth, so. Any other thoughts on this? Thank you, Chris, for bringing this up. And I think as we have thoughts to bring them back to each other or to share them with Sarah or with the entire, with the entire committee. So let's move on. Uh, we have um, one other, and maybe I can suggest we, we do this now, which is to re review and approve the council order for the water-based recreation expedited grant that goes to uh, city council. That's supposed to come after this funding recommendations, but if I can suggest that we move that, bounce that up so we can take care of that. Um, I think we do this as someone making a motion. Is that correct, sir? Correct. So is there a motion to approve the water-based recreation expedited grant council order? So I'm moved. Muted. Uh, so moved by Jack, is there a second? Uh, second, second. All right, thank you. We got a couple seconds there. Um, discussion? Uh, Sarah, once again, after the whereas is, I think there's sort of inconsistent, uh, whatever that word is, punctuation I, with periods and semicolons. I the semicolons, I'll make those consistent. Never understand. They're all supposed to be semicolons, is that right? Yes. I, I know who gives a shit, but still uh, being consistent. Um, any other comments on this one, Martha? Yes, in the first, um, I think it's important that we add uh, something about um, the public engagement process is going to be associated with this project, as I do think that's a really critical piece of it. Um, and the success of that, I think, is also um, is going to be really important um, to really determine what happens at these sites. So I want to emphasize, I would like to emphasize that. Is there language you can suggest, Martha? To is that a is that a separate whereas or is that in nope? I think it could be in the same whereas. Um, so uh, uh, could begin by saying um, submitted an application for feasibility study to um, in, um, solicit public input. Yeah, solicit public input assess existing informal swimming areas on the mill in Connecticut rivers, et cetera. Would that phrase solicit input, that, that would satisfy you, Martha, too? Mm -hmm. That's all you need? I think so. Other discussion on this recommendation? Are we ready to vote on this? Okay, Sarah, can you lead us through? Brian? Uh, yes. Linda? Yes. Chris? Yes. Dan? Yes. Julia? Yep. Jack? Yes. Martha? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Is it great? Suggestion and it is a really important piece that public comment. Really important. Yeah. yeah. Um, so 
We have, uh, we could move on to begin funding recommendations with the five proposals that are in front of us. I think in the past, what has worked well for us, someone correct me if I'm wrong, is that we do, we, we have a, a, a block of time long enough where we can talk about and deal with all of the proposals in one evening, rather than do a couple now and then wait until two weeks from now and do a few and then we've forgotten what it is that we talked about. Um, so I would suggest we either commit now to a length of time where we talk about and deal with all five of the proposals in front of us, or we uh, acknowledge the exhaustion level that some of us uh, probably have and put that funding discussion off until the 18th. Uh, and that will really be our only item on that, uh, on the agenda, is that correct, Sarah? That will correct. be about it is to make it through the funding for the uh, for those five proposals. Um, so I'm going to make a suggestion, if I may, that we that we put discussion off so we can sort of deal with it in a in a coherent or somewhat coherent way, at least for some of us um, who stayed up all night. Uh, is that any objection to that, or do people really want to push forward and move ahead on that? I, I I would uh, I'd like to do it when uh, my mental faculties are a little bit more refreshed. But I want to apologize to David, who has hung in here all this time. I think probably to hear our discussion, David Murphy. Um, uh, I, I I think you'd be better served if we were all <laughs> fully here. And it looks like David Herslips is back uh, as yeah, well. I'm, I'm so I'll be I'll be back again next meeting. Don't worry about that. Okay. And other David. Thank you. Uh, same thing. You could uh, thank you for hanging in there with us or coming back to us. But uh, so it is so I, is everybody okay with putting this off until the 18th? Martha, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, that you know actually I just I need to. That's fine. Putting it off to the 18th is great, and I just want to uh, raise one point too. So. Okay. You raise that point now oh, okay um on the um david uh, david murphy you're still there on the uh, smith um charities building i believe the structural engineer in that project is john watney am i right about that yeah yeah john from okay. structures north right so john is a, a colleague of mine and he's actually working for me right now on a project and i just i didn't know whether that would prevent me from voting i just wanted to raise that Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's I want you to seek advice from Sarah on that, because if you feel it's a conflict, it would be best to recuse yourself. But right. check with Sarah about that and see, you know, what the opinion and, and the and the remainder of your committee and see if it makes sense to stay out of it. Um, but it's not a bad thing because you, you know how qualified he is and what a good job he does. I mean, he's a he's a great engineer. We're really lucky right. to have him. And if you know, if that if, if that ultimately compromises your ability to vote on this, that's okay, because at least you can attest to the fact that he's a great guy and he knows what he's doing and we're very lucky to have him on the project. Well, he loves the building, I know that too. <laughs> well, I thought his mass historic, it, they're crazy about the place. So anyway, I just want to put that out there, you know, for the next, next meeting, in case Thank I forget. You. Thank you, Martha. And, and uh, uh, whatever you and Sarah decide regarding that, Okay. Um, I don't think it takes you out of the discussion mm -hmm. and those of us looking to you or I'll speak for myself for me looking to you as our historic preservation uh, expert for sort of advice and thoughts and comments regarding the, the, the Smith building. So as long as you're not taken out of that. Um, okay. But uh, I, I think that's something perhaps for you and Sarah to uh, Martha, I'll follow up with you by email. There's a there's a disclosure form that you probably should file with the mayor, um, but it doesn't sound like you have a direct um, financial interest, so it probably isn't an issue. I do, no, I do not. Okay, sure. Good. So. We hope to hope to keep you here for that. Uh, so so we're good with putting things off to the 18th. Yes. Nodding heads. Okay. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Uh, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second? 
Second. And we will bypass the Sarah roll call vote and just wave our hands goodbye to each other. Get some sleep, everybody. Thumbs up. Democracy is still intact as of uh, 8 14 on Wednesday evening, November the 4th, and we will hope that it stays that way. Um, thank you all, and we'll see you in uh, two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.